Welcome in to Revealing Grace. This is a podcast focused on the revelation of God's redeeming grace throughout all of Scripture and the power that it has to transform lives eternally. I'm Chris Sobeck, and here in a moment you'll hear from Dr. Brian Chapel. Now this episode is a little bit different than some other episodes that we've had in that while we are still discussing the sermon, and this sermon is part of a sermon series, which is Through the Bible in a Year, We're really taking time to discuss some of the issues that we are facing um, internationally and also specifically nationally here in the United States. Um, Some of the racial tension and unrest that that we're facing, um, the inequities that have been a part of systemic racism, uh, and also some of the, the things that we're all facing as a result of um, COVID-19 and the coronavirus. So it's it's somewhat of a difficult conversation, a conversation that needs to be had. Where is God amidst all this, amidst this, this struggle, this strife, this pain? Um, what sort of message does he have for us? Where do we find our hope? And as we dive into Hebrews, Hebrews 12, uh, we will discuss that more and pray that, that God has allowed us to speak uh, truth and to um, be able to wrestle with these issues as as God reveals himself to us in his scripture once again. So I hope that you are able to take this podcast and maybe it can be a starting point for you to have dialogue uh, with others that you know and even wrestle with yourself as we dive into the scripture and seek God's wisdom as he reveals his grace to us. All right, Brian, glad to be able to, to join you again. Uh, I see that the background has changed from, from our previous episodes. I, so what am I seeing behind you right now? My backyard. So <laughs> I think you saw my office, but you know, getting a little more uh, expertise in Zoom, I've learned to do a virtual background. How <laughs> well, there about we that? go. There, there we go. You're, you're still seeing my actual background. So maybe next yes. time I will, I'll show the outside of my house. It's not uh-huh. quite as picturesque as yours, but. Yes. Um, well, so, you know, we've had a very uh, wet spring. So uh, one, one cloudy morning, it was just, the light was just right to take a picture into our woods. So I did. Yeah, no, it's great. It's great. So yeah, if, if anyone is actually um, watching uh, the the YouTube video that we'll have of this, then they can see that. Um, otherwise, you can just imagine in your mind <laughs> oh, what it might look like. But okay, so um, let's let's start things out with a revealing question. Um, you know, some of the previous ones have been, I guess, a little bit more humorous, but I was thinking, um, I know something that you love is fishing. So what, um, where's your favorite place to go fishing and why? So there's no way I'm going to tell you my favorite place to go fishing. (laughs) And everyone is waiting like, Oh boy, here we go. Yeah. No. So, (laughs) so I will say my favorite place to go fishing is actually a bird sanctuary. And, uh, the consequence of that is (laughs) there are a lot of birders and not many fishermen. And that's a good thing. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, for, for the fisherman, for sure. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's fair enough. That, that I was not trying to trick you. I feel like you passed some sort of test though. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You're asking like magicians to reveal how they do yeah, their tricks. Yeah. There's no way. Well, <laughs> okay. Well, we know that you like to fish and, and there's a place that you like to go. We can leave it at that. Yes. We can leave it at that. All right. Well, uh, to get into this uh, episode... The sermon that you spoke on was, uh, well, the passage that you spoke on during the sermon was Hebrews 12. Um, And, you know, there's a lot that is happening uh, culturally, both domestically and internationally, Um, so many different issues. Uh, So there are certainly some some truths in the scripture that that I know are are very applicable. So what was kind of your thought process as you you went to put together the sermon, um, maybe even revise the sermon as you prepared for Sunday? Well, you know that we we're at the very end almost of a year-long series called Through the Bible in a Year, in which I try to show the unfolding plan of God to disclose his grace for his people and then to have his people become his witness in the world of that redeeming work of our Savior. Um, so I was 
in that portion of scripture, uh, the book of Hebrews, where after the Lord has sent his disciples into the world as witnesses and churches are sprouting up in different parts of the ancient world, uh, persecution grows very intense upon the church. And as persecution grows and uh, physical as well as religious opposition, uh, there are people who are considering turning back. You know, is this what we, is this what we bargained on? Is, is this Jesus really worth it with all the suffering that uh, comes? And so the writer of Hebrews is writing to say, you know, Christ is superior to every other choice. And the moment in time at which I wrote that, I, I think you know, Chris, I, I, had, I had written uh, the message uh, in the midweek in which most of the world news was on a pandemic and people wondering, you know, if God is so good, why is all this happening to us? But then as I went to bed on Saturday night because of the, the injustice with which uh, George Floyd was dealt with, in Minneapolis, and riots were breaking out in many North American cities, including our own town, um, you, you must know that I began to wonder uh, that, that question, if, if God is for us, then why is this happening to us? Not, not just a pandemic, but now our city's coming undone with uh, racial animosity and terrible things that have happened to people of color for for centuries now, again, showing their ugliness, and then people responding as, as hurt people do. And uh, you and I were talking about this broadcast, just the, the sense of heaviness on us at this point as we, we look at the hurting of our world. And to say, what was the writer of Hebrews saying to people uh, in his own time? If, if God is really for us, why is all this happening to us? And looking at the hope that he was seeking to give people that would give them strength to stay with the program. You are my witnesses in this broken world, but also point forward to the hope that made that program worthwhile. So I, I said to you before we started talking here, I, I kind of went uh, all day Saturday thinking I had one sermon and then Saturday night and Sunday morning um, kind of constructing, not totally different, but a, a lot of different emphasis because of what was happening in our nation and world. You know, like you just said, and, and had we had discussed before we started recording this, um, I think both of us, I know I can speak for myself, uh, a very heavy heart knowing just the many ways that people are struggling. Um, definitely here within the United States. I know we have international listeners to this podcast as well, and um, they're facing any number of issues as well, not the least of which being the pandemic. Um, you know, so when you come to a passage of scripture like this and we kind of reflect, uh, it can be, it can be easy to, to, as you said, question why continue to call upon the Lord? Why continue to, to follow him? Um, so I guess I ask you that question. Why, so why? why, why do we? Yeah, it was quite a week, uh, Chris. So I, I think i I mentioned in the message itself that at, um, at early in that week, I was on some international phone calls with believers in other parts of the world who are experiencing persecution from their government and nonetheless see the gospel growing in a time of both persecution and pandemic. Um, and even during that phone call, there was kind of an historic church leader who joined the call to say, um, if God is pruning, John 15 makes it clear, what is the reason for the pruning? He only means to bear more fruit. And that's kind of hard to receive. Uh, you, you go a little bit further into the week, and uh, we as a church were struggling because the governing authorities over our state were arguing uh, at the Supreme Court level about whether they were going to let churches worship or not. And churches have to wrestle how much worship do we allow, not just because of the governing authorities, but because of what is safe for our people? And our mm -hmm. people being torn between uh, those perspectives, safekeeping, obey the government, 
Um, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That's in the Bible. Uh, whom do we honor here and what do we prioritize? And we feel that push and pull and tension in our own church. And then by the end of the week, we have a nation that's in uproar uh, of, I mean, just almost incredible to believe, to, to watch a man killed um, on film um, in an unjust, clearly uncaring way by those authorities that ought to be expressing the most protection uh, to our, uh, our populace. And of course, rage. Uh, breaking out, so you know, I'm going, I'm going to bed on Saturday night and and wa- watching riots in my own town that are breaking in live action uh, into um, looting of stores and fires being set and and thinking, what do I say to God's people tomorrow? So, it, it, again, in the Lord's provision, I was dealing with a passage where God's people were already experiencing a lot of a lot of pain, and how do I say this? A kind of tough love writer of Hebrews saying, all right, you got some alternatives. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you can turn away from this Jesus. Um, who do you want to go to? You, you want to go to a God who makes sense of it all to your present understanding. So, you know, everything will just make sense to you. Well, who is that God? Well, you've seen him. He's the God of holiness and righteousness. So that if you even get close to him, you die. And um, so just, just going to a God who only makes sense to your capacities is ultimately going to destroy you because your capacities are not sufficient to take in a broken, sinful world and still have hope. So if you're not going to base your hope on what your eyes can see and your hands can touch and what you can just kind of make sense of in your own capacity, what are you going to trust? And he really turns our eyes to a God who's working on an eternal scale and a heavenly stage to turn people away from false idols in a world that will go away to hope in a God who is eternal in an eternity that will set all things right. And he's doing that so people do not forget who God is, what their hope is, and what their responsibility of witness is. Now, I've talked a long time here, Chris, but I mean, it was, it was kind of a devastating evening. You know, I'm sitting here, um, you know, I got up early that morning to kind of rewrite the message. And, and, and the more I rewrote, the more I felt the weight of what I was saying. And um, now, you were there with those few other people in this pandemic session, you know, the few people that are allowed to gather in the church in this moment in history. But it just, it just felt overwhelmingly heavy in terms of circumstance and overwhelmingly important in terms of Scripture. So I was trying to say to people, it is really bad. Who can deny that? It is really bad. But that is not a reason to walk away from the God who has hope. That's, that's the truth. That's the truth. You know, I think in our human nature, we, we want to understand how God works, why he works, and to kind of um, almost in our own way limit God to whatever capacity we can understand, um, which you shared some about that, you know, what some of the dangers in, in trying to do that. Um, I know, speaking for myself, um, as hard as it is to to deal with, I, I would not want to serve a God that is only as capable as I can understand. Um, so, and I, and you kind of address that. So um, yeah, where do, where do we turn? How do we deal with, with this, this feeling of, I, I wish I understood why this was happening. What, why would, why would God allow this to happen to, to his people, to, to people in general? Um, and um, why should we take comfort in knowing that we can't fully understand everything? Well, we, we take comfort that God is bigger than we are, yeah. that there's a, a plan larger than our capacity, l- larger than what we could arrange, but still effective for eternal purposes. And so if the world were totally without trouble, would anybody turn to God for help? Hmm. If um, 
we had not seen other believers in the scriptures or in church history who have experienced great evil. It's hard to say, but worse issues than we ourselves in this present moment are experiencing. Hmm. And I listed some of those, you know, where you've, you've had religious wars where people standing for their faith were ejected from their churches or killed where two thirds of the Christians known in a nation at a particular time are wiped out where the wars go on for decades and, and, and people don't see any hope. And you say, what, what was the result of that? And it actually was something very similar to what was happening in Hebrews that the persecution was dispersing believing Christians across the world and therefore to new populations and new nations and new people who needed the eternal hope of the gospel. And that would have been nobody's choice at the time. They would have been crazy to say, I want to lose my home and lose my friends and experience great suffering so I can tell the world I mean, about Jesus. Well, no one would choose that. But what they chose was to take up their cross daily as Christ had taken up his cross for us in order to be the witnesses wherever God would call them, through whatever God would call them for the purposes that they believed were eternal, that these were, as heavy as they were, were light afflictions compared to the eternal weight of glory that God was establishing for his people. And the writer of Hebrews is saying that, but what's so cool in that, in that chapter 12 of Hebrews is that the writer's kind of pulling back the veil saying, let me show you what's ahead <laughs> kind of beyond your headlights. You know, you can look in your rear view mirror and say, God used things that were not seemingly good at the time to accomplish a good purpose. But at the same time, you begin to recognize that God is not just asking you to look in the rear view mirror. He's, he's pulling back the veil. So you see beyond your headlights into heaven itself. And, and there you see the angels rejoicing over God's purposes being fulfilled, that you see an assembly of the firstborn of God, not just a firstborn, not just Jesus, but an assembly of people who have that status of the firstborn. And, and that means that there has been this multitude of people who've been called out of the trials of the world into the hope of heaven, where eternity is freed of all these tears and trials. And the angels are rejoicing over the assembly that is gathered. There's this festival, this party of rejoicing what God has done out of the trials of the world to redeem his children forever. And to know that you're part of that purpose, whether it's good times or bad, fat times or lean, is what, what keeps us moving forward and keeps us witnessing and I pray even keeps us pursuing one another in a time where there's been such injustice, such, I mean, the writer of Hebrews is writing to people who've lost everything. They are the ones who have suffered. They are the ones who have experienced injustice. And he's not saying, oh, it doesn't matter. He is saying the world may abandon you, but God will not. There may not be justice in this world, but he says right in this passage, but, but God is the judge of all things, and he will ultimately gather those before himself as the righteous judge to set things right and to set before his own throne of glory all those that would be blessed forever by his righteousness. You know, amidst a number of these various trials that, and, and difficulties that are being faced, um, things that I can't even fully speak to uh, for fear of showing my ignorance of, of knowing the pain that people are struggling with, um, there can be a lot of feeling of um, division. Um, but as the body of believers, there's, there are things that we unite on. Um, so what are ways in which we can find that, that unity and, and to, you know, you talk about, um, you know, heavenly hosts like celebrating and the angels celebrating, like what, what are things that we can celebrate? What are things that we can unite on during this time? Well, I, I don't want to make light of it. The, the God that we worship is the judge of all, and he is the just judge. So where there has been injustice, there will be righteousness. Mm -hmm. 
where there has been unfairness, there will be a writing of the scales. Now, that's not just pie in the sky by and by. It becomes those who follow Christ, their responsibility to speak to it and live for it even this day. And, and that means being informed about the issues. And, and here I struggle at times with, with those in my own ranks. And, and Chris, you and I have to say, here's two Anglo guys talking about the, you know, yeah. the suffering of people of color in this nation. But we have, we have to recognize we cannot fully identify, but we have to try. And you know, we, we, regardless of our nationality, are of ne- ethnicities who did suffer at some point persecution and racism in this nation. I mean, I'm of Irish background and, you know, there, there were terrible persecutions in the major cities of, of the United States against the Irish. It has not been as persistent or as long or as deep as what African Americans experience. So I have to say, I can just t- barely taste the evil that my African American brothers and sisters have had to taste. I can, I can just barely taste it mm. and, and not fully identify with it. But in my own ranks, what I hear so often is people say, but I, I have no hatred toward black people. I have, I have no hatred toward people who live in other parts of town and, in a sense, excuse themselves from any further concern. It is so hard for those of us who are Anglo, who experience the blessings of being white in a culture of privilege, to say... The, the fact that I don't hold personal animosity toward you does not mean that I do not have racist attitudes or perspectives in myself. Because if I'm willing to be silent or blind to systemic racism, to recognize that just a few miles from where I live, those communities will have a third of their young men in prison at some point in their lifetime. I mean, if in my neighborhood, in my community, a third of the young men that I looked at would would be in prison at some point, if I would say, everybody who lives in my neighborhood, you have no real chance of making more than about 60% of the income than everybody else in the community, that regardless of where you live, you will not see a person representing your skin color who is in any significant political office to help you. Might you be a little bit mad? Might you be a little bit concerned? And might you be a little upset with people who said, well, I don't have any personal animosity toward you? To say, while I appreciate that, it is not enough. And and I just have to say, you know, Chris, I mean, last night I'm I'm on the phone call with pastors from across our region. And in candor, most of them are white. And it's it's because so many of the African-American brothers and sisters with whom I've worked in this community have said, what is the use? We talk and talk about the fact that we get along with each other, but it does not change our culture and it does not protect our people. And, you know, we have to say that. And we have to seek to do what we can to work beyond the obvious disparities that are in communities that are beyond personal relationships that are systemic and decades long and say this is evil. If, you know, the African Americans of a particular community are 20% of the commerce, but they own less than 2%, no, 0.02% of the economic ability of the, of, of, the community, you have to say, th- this is not fair. This is not just. And we're not, we're not going to have a magic wand to fix it. Uh, we're not going to fix it in a conversation or in a sermon. But we have to be willing to say, this is not right. And uh, rioting is not right. Um, damaging, hurting other people is not right. But silence is not right either. And, you know, when the writer of Hebrews is addressing his own people who are saying, I'm turning you to God who is the judge of all the earth, it's because he is yet the God of justice and we're supposed to represent him. Um, 
I know for me, um, it has been my desire to, to try to see, to see the world, uh, through God's eyes as best as, as I can, as I, as I ask him to, to show that to me, to understand, um, you know, what breaks his heart. Uh, and that is, of course, sin and injustice. Um, and, and I think as we, you know, we talk about this passage of scripture, we talk about turning, turning to the Lord, turning back to the Lord. Um, we also can rejoice in knowing that he is all powerful that, you know, you talked about how, um, you know, he, he whispers to us and blessings, but that he shouts in our pain. And I think that we have, we have a powerful God who does not ignore that does not ignore our pain is not, is not hidden, is not silent, does not go away amidst the pain and is only there during times of rejoicing. Um, and I think that as painful as that is, we can also take comfort in knowing that his love is constant. You know, there's a, a lot of what can seem like empty rhetoric, but I know that, that, that God is at work, even though we don't know all the ways that he is at times. Um, and and yeah. it's hard to know, Chris. I mean, I think, you know, here, here I am in my mid sixties and I think, what am I going to say that I have not said dozens of time yeah. in, in my ministry? What, what am I going to do that I have not tried to do year after year after year? And, you know, even as I know I'm transitioning from this community to a uh, church office for, you know, a whole lot, big number of churches that, you know, I become in some measure responsible for, I recognize as God just saying, you cannot walk away from this situation because you're going to another job. Because the whole nation is struggling with this. And yeah. if the Lord allows me to preach his word, I have to say, God is the judge of all the earth. And yeah. he will gather people from every tribe and language and people and nation. And that will happen because the brother and sisterhood of God has risen up, not only to say, what is the, the nature of the grace of God that has been provided for the undeserving, but how does that cause us to treat one another when we recognize there is undeservedness on every side. You know, there, there, there are people who are undeserving of um, forgiveness because they have been silent. There are people undeserving of kindness because they have been cruel. There are people who may say, well, you are undeserving of being in my church and my community and my economic bracket because you haven't earned it. It does not matter. The grace of God is telling us that we will extend the mercy of God to whoever he puts in our circle, mm. in our path. I don't want to say circle because that may sound like there are people where, you know, if they're not in our yeah. circle, we don't have to be nice to them. Yeah. Whoever's in our path, who, who is ever in God's purpose, whoever's made in the image of God is, is deserving of dignity and respect and our advocacy as much as God gives us opportunity. So uh, we, we very quickly, uh, I've been in these discussions so many times, I know the next question. So are you in favor of reparations or not? You know, I mean, that almost always, is, do I have to give up anything in order to be kind to those people who are unlike me? And I almost want to say, that's the next discussion. Let, let's start with the discussion of, is anything wrong in the present situation? Yeah. Is is there anything not not just in your personal feelings? Is there anything wrong institutionally that you can acknowledge beyond personal relationships or lack of personal animosity? Is there any institutional wrong that you can observe? And when I think we get some I'm not going to say the word honesty. I think when we get some awareness about that, then we're ready for discussions about all right, now what is fair to do? And, and uh, if, if we are not willing to explore the depth of systemic and institutional racism, then we will not get to helpful conversations about what to do for low graduation rates and improper education when you're just a mile from somebody else who lives across a tax district. I mean, I, I can go a long time with the inequities. 
Yeah. But the reality is other people have to see it than, <laughs> than preachers who seem like they have no power over the real harm that's going on in the culture. We do because God's word is powerful and we have to keep preaching it and saying it even in the face of systemic racism and institutional prejudice, even where there is not personal prejudice. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, you know, so to return to what is a constant message and that is that, you know, God has loved us and shown continues to show his grace to us. And because of that, we're compelled to do the same and, you know, to, to act in love and, and to, to serve and follow him in whatever way that he's called us to do. And that forces us, you know, knowing that, believing that forces us to, to look into our own hearts and know, to, to better know, um, you know, what, what blind spots we might have. Um, and yeah, there, the, the inequities are, innumerable there there's there's so much there um but it's a conversation that we need to continue to have there's a reason chris and and the reason i mean again the writer of hebrews is saying you know if your world is shaking remember god is once again going to shake the world there will be a worse shaking if this makes some fear and trepidation and what's happened to our world and what's happened to my 401k and What's happened to my family? You know, if, if, if there's some shaking going on, then recognize God is saying, this is not the end of the shaking. You know, th- this is only precursor to God saying, once more, I will shake the earth and the heavens. And, and I will re- make you recognize the seriousness of any less foundation than the, than the righteousness and the mercy of trusting in Jesus Christ alone. So, you know, the writer of Hebrews says, so, you know, we should be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken because Mm -hmm. what's happening in our world right now is the clear message that everything in your world can shake. Yeah. And there is no security apart from a God who would be merciful to you. So with this great awareness of inequities and persecution and pain and difficulty is the message that says, so turn away from what is shaky to what cannot be shaken, which is the kingdom of God and trust in the one who provides mercy above all things and take his message to those who have been shaken so that they may be in that unshakable kingdom with you. So in gratitude, turn toward the God whose kingdom is unshakable. He is a consuming fire. He will consume away, consume every distraction, every false idol, every Christless entertainment, every false hope, he will, he will consume it all. Why? So you say, uh-oh, there's nothing else left but this Jesus to bank on. And we turn to him and turn other hearts to him when we trust in nothing less and represent him and him alone in the way that we do our business in the world. I hope this episode is a starting point for a discussion. This is truly only the beginning of a discussion. There's so much more that we could get into and needs to be discussed. Uh, so I would encourage you to read the scriptures uh, and also seek out your brothers and sisters in the Lord, seeking out understanding and um, seeking reconciliation. I, I hope that this podcast is... Um, open your eyes a little as it is our desire for God to reveal his grace to us through the scripture and through this podcast. Um, If you have um, been moved uh, by this episode or or touched by uh, our discussion, I encourage you to like this podcast. Uh, We are always seeking to put out new content that is honoring to God and and that is challenging and is stretching us and helping us to grow in our faith. So subscribe to it. You'll know the next time that we have a new podcast that is out. Um, I also would encourage you, if this has raised any questions, any thoughts, things that you would like uh, to be discussed on the podcast, you can send those comments to revealing grace at brianchapel.com and we will look over those emails. 
at brianchapel.com. There are many resources to help you in your personal walk and also can be a resource as you interact with others. You can direct them to the website, whether it's for sermons, uh, illustrations. There's a series called Walking in Grace, which is a great opportunity to hear from Brian in these short little snippets where he really shares from his heart and can um, speak truth in in just a, a matter of minutes. If you are seeking additional training, I encourage you to check out the courses section. There you will find pastoral training that can help you to speak with gospel confidence, knowing that you can speak boldly because the truth that you're speaking is not your own, but it comes from the Word of God. Thank you for taking time to listen to this episode of the podcast. We look forward to having you join us again next time as we just continue to dive into the Word of God and seek to understand His working and to see how He reveals His grace to us throughout His Word.